welcome to the integral stage and welcome Alexander. Last time we had a conversation with you, it was really great. And uh, we touched on a concept of membranics that you mentioned, and we noticed possibly some areas of overlap and interest with our own concerns around uh, metaphysics of adjacency or generative enclosures, prepositions. So we thought it would be a great idea to, you know, dive deeper into that and like to, you know, just open the floor up and we can, we can explore it as we'd like. I think we'd love to hear from you about membranics. And I think Lehman can also talk about uh, metaphysics of adjacency and I'll talk about generative enclosures at some point. Yeah, I was going to ask Lehman to maybe start with adjacency because A is prior to M and E. So but <laughs> off you go, Lehman. Alphabetically. King of Canada, Lehman Pascal for you. Um, for me, the metaphysics of adjacency is a way of trying to describe the metaphysics that's still conserved when we become explicitly post-metaphysical and kind of the contextual architecture that's presupposed by pluralism and integrative thought and non-duality. So it has to do with um, making the sense of the in-between kind of conceptually prior to the notion of two separate total things that happen to be in a relationship. So there's a number of different ways to think about what's between, right? There's a prepositionally, like Bruce thinks about it, there's an orienting gesture in that in-between space. There's also boundaries, but those boundaries are always only almost boundaries because they have to also function as non-boundaries. So in that space of being near or close to or proximal or adjacent, there's a kind of gradient that's flexible when we think about it apart from the two things that are just in the relationship. And that flexible gradient is generative. It functions as a simultaneous sameness and a difference. It gives us the ability for things to be in uh, active relationships that cause new phenomena sort of it goes along with field thinking it goes along with complementarity and physics fits a lot of the new philosophical and scientific thinking that's been going on for the last 50 or 100 years and i think it fundamentally helps us to de-reify reality without losing any of the functional gains that we get from the metaphor of solid thingness can I just ask you then, because you Americans are really into prefixes, right? You've got prefixflation all the time. <laughs> so you have this term here, just it, it's a minor detail, but I just want to figure that out. So you use the term post metaphysics, and I've seen Bruce use it too quite a lot. Uh, okay. To say that there could be any such thing as post metaphysics to Hegel, at least, would be in itself a metaphysical claim. Exactly. So, so, so I want to figure out what do you what do you guys mean when you say post metaphysics? So when I say post metaphysics, because I refuse to use the word. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm like one of these straight guys who refuses to have gay sex. It's just like I'm not going to do it. So, but why why did you describe what you mean with it? Because obviously you use it a lot. Yeah, I mean it in a couple of different ways. First of all, any metaphysical system that tries to come after or envelop any other metaphysical system is post metaphysical relative to the previous system. So if we're thinking in terms of phases or stages or layers then each one is always somewhat of a reference of clarifying the metaphysics of the previous system up to a certain point where it becomes a little bit more explicit. It starts to become explicit with modern rationalism and science where they try to say, hey, a whole bunch of things in traditional cosmology, that's not really there. We're going to replace those assumptions. And then deconstructive postmodern kind of nuances come in and they make that same argument around modern assumptions. Are we really sure about matter? Are we really sure that one equals one? So there's a, a, a flexible nuancing around these points, which undoes their concretization. And, but obviously, a post-metaphysical system is still a metaphysical system. That's what led me to think the metaphysics of adjacency. Like what metaphysics is absolutely implied by anybody who thinks they're being post-metaphysical? Okay, but my point here is that since I don't believe there are any really new narratives, except that there are, there are new interactions between human beings through new technologies. I think the only things that really changed in, let's say, the last 10,000 years that we call civilization are technological developments that we then adjust to, which, by the way, is, of course, a Canadian, Marshall McLuhan, who thought through this properly. So my argument here would be that uh, since there are really no new narratives, just new variations of these narratives, I would disagree that there can be anything like post-metaphysics. But I would love to hear Bruce's take on this one, because obviously, Bruce, you're a great fan of Bruno Latour. Yes. And Bruno Latour has written a very famous book with a very clever title, 
called We Were Never Moderns. So how, how do you sort of, if you think with a sort of Ken Wilber's kind of, we go from one idea to the next idea to the next idea, and there's sort of a, a progress of ideas and a sort of development of ideas. And it, it, it integrates, of course, quite nicely towards some kind of a global perspective, a sort of God's eye perspective, which is, you know, an interesting position to take. But how do you sort of sit there, Bruce, and you're apparently both a fan of Latour and Wilbur. So how do you relate to post-metaphysics here? Because post-metaphysics, I, I would never expect Bruno Latour to use such a term, but I would certainly expect it to come out of Ken Wilber's mouth, for example. <laughs> do you agree with me on that one? I would, yeah, definitely. And in fact, we picked up this word from Wilbur. Um, he started to use it in the latest phase of his writing. And, you know, I opened up a forum, Integral Post-Metaphysical Spirituality, mainly to explore the idea of what he's trying to get at because at first it seemed pretty incoherent to me. And I was disturbed by it, and I thought he's maybe taking a wrong turn in his thought. But it might be useful, it might be productive, and so I opened up the forum, and maybe over 12 to 15 years, we did a lot of inquiry on that site, not always on that topic, but uh, we you know, tried to give the idea of a post-metaphysics drawing from Habermas and other people it's due because Habermas is, you know, of course, writing about post-metaphysical thinking and Wilbur is inspired a little bit by the way he frames things prospectively and, and all of that. So we tried to explore the concept and mine it and try to determine. Wilbur says that you need at least a minimal metaphysics. And so we were exploring what's going on with that is, is, it's, to me, that wasn't satisfactory. A minimal metaphysics, it's just like, why not still stay with metaphysics? Or can you go beyond it? And so that was part of the inquiry on that forum, through which I discovered object-oriented ontology and Latour's work and Sloterdijk and many others. As we kind of started diving into all of the you know, contemporary philosophy, before that, I was reading Eastern philosophy, not Western philosophy. I was reading Nagarjuna and, 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 and you know all of the older texts um, and had not really trusted, well, I kind of had a bias against Western philosophy ignorantly. But over the course of that 15 years, we dove into Western philosophy and tried to understand what is the lineage behind this move that Wilbur is trying to make towards post-metaphysics. I think where we arrived at is post-metaphysics is a way of at least, basically it's post um you could say myth of the given. It's, it's really struggling with what Derrida and, and Heidegger and others were looking at with the idea of, of the given and the metaphysics of presence, where there's just this immediate, unmediated access to things or the, uh, the ability to take a God's eye view from nowhere and summarize reality. Um, so there was a uh, a movement towards recognizing situatedness and contextuality and participation. So in that sense, the way I came to regard it is it's post a particular kind of metaphysics, what kind of dominated for a time, but it's not post any kind of metaphysics that has ever existed. And it's definitely not beyond metaphysics in our own way of thinking and framing things now. I like that you mentioned Nagarjuna because he think he fits our definition of post metaphysics. Like obviously we don't need that word. We could call it anything we wanted. It has it's not the same as uh, a linear. You know, like McLuhan is really good at specifying that something isn't higher just because it's newer, just because it's adapted to the new conditions doesn't make it superior to the new conditions. Now, there are things that might be superior to the new conditions, but they may have occurred at other times in other conditions of adaptation historically. So in, in the Garjanist thinking and in the, in the Zen communication styles, the koan structures, I see a lot of what I'm calling adjacency and what we're calling post-metaphysics in those thinking styles. And I think there's a lot of different great historical thinkers, both philosophers and sages, who uh, brought forth the very kind of thing we're trying to describe the architecture of. 
Okay, I'm sitting here in the adjacency between day and night. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me when I'm talking, but if you, I you know, see. yeah, okay, it's okay. It's, it's like the light is there. So speaking of adjacency, what I'm interested in here, though, especially with you, Bruce, you spent so much time and you're a very learned person, obviously. So you spent so much time studying Eastern philosophy. You started there. And then finally, you get caught on Western philosophy. But apparently, Wilbur opened the door to you there, right there. Speaking of adjacency, so once you got into Western philosophy, did you see patterns that were similar? And in that case, did you sort of trace those patterns from kind, kind of universal conditions or was there a heritage? Because I've always been interested in how Eastern and Western philosophy originally influenced each other. And that's why my, my basic point is that we can't start with the Greeks. We must start much earlier to, to even understand the West. And I, I would say the West is the Middle East. And we added Europe and some cannon boats and, and some printing presses 400 years ago. And then, you know, our, we got so big headed that we thought that we were the center of the planet. But, 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 it, but in reality, did you see that connection between East and West? And was it easier for you to see patterns that occurred? Definitely, yes. Yeah, I was noticing patterns and I was also suspicious of Wilbur's easy equivalencies that he would say, you know, God is Brahman, is Allah. I saw that there were similarities, functional similarities within ecologies of thought, um, similar patterns within systems of thought, but they weren't identical reference necessarily. They served, served similar functions. So I like the way Raymond Panikar describes it as homeomorphic equivalencies across topologies of meaning. And there definitely are similar patterns across these different systems. I do think in some cases there's, you know, cultural um, interblending and influence that we haven't possibly fully mined. You know, for instance, I, I know that there are some studies of the influence between Bun culture and not only Buddhist culture, but also Persian culture. You know, so there's different or, or you know, uh, some, some Middle East, even Essene tradition with some influence between Dzogchen and, and the Essene tradition. So, you know, I think there are influences that have not been fully mined yet. We, we don't really have a full sense of of maybe what's happened in that cross fertilization, but I think it's a combination. Some just discovering similar patterns, um, d enacting homeomorphically equivalent concepts within different ecologies of thought, but others that I think there are, you know, um, fertile interblendings, which I, I love your whole, you know, thought line uh, along the Silk Road and, and what kind of mingling and adjacencies happened there. I think what what's the the book. Uh, a story waiting to pierce you, where uh, he explores. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember what the author's name is. It's escaping me at the moment, but it's called a story waiting to pierce you, and it's looking at how a Mongolian shaman uh, was doing a kind of purification circuit around the Middle East and went into Europe. He went through Middle East, went through Asia, and went into Europe, and he met with Pythagoras, and there was a deep meeting of minds and, and apparently an initiatory event that happened between this Mongolian shaman and Pythagoras that kind of led to this, uh, you know, mystery school and, and, and deeper, you know, school of knowledge that basically flowered in, in, in Greece. Yeah, I, I would even add that Pythagoras very likely spent some five to 10 years at the Persian court before he became a Greek philosopher. Like, so a lot of the Greek philosophers has certainly Persian origins. And, and uh, you know, I went with my team to Xi'an in China, where everybody should go as soon as you can, because Xi'an is the Rome of China. This was like the world's biggest city for almost 2000 years. Cairo was the second biggest one. And it was stunning to see how huge the Persian quarters, as they were called, were in Xi'an in China for, for like, you know, a couple of thousand years. Hmm. So the Silk Road, rather than being just a communication channel for philosophy and theology, as we would call it today, rather I would say that we call philosophy and theology today originate along the Silk Road. Hmm. And, and all the traditions we have today, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and eventually Western philosophy, etc., all start there. And, and from the Renaissance on Venice being this affluent city, which is like the Northwestern outpost for the trade coming out of Cairo, going into Europe. That, that, that's, that's where we get the sort of modern Europe and the idea of the modern Europe that comes from there. I think this notion of ancient cross-pollinization is really important because I think uh, 
a lot of the sages who are very resonant with the kind of thinking that itself is very resonant with digital technology. And I think that's kind of what we're describing is a way of thinking that's appropriate to our current world and space that we see showing up in different leading edge domains of that world space. It elicits or reinvokes certain elements of ancient thinking. And it turns out that a lot of what's being reinvoked is this are the sages of cross pollinization. And in part because they lived through and experienced their own wisdom as a dynamic intersectional process. I agree. And here's the thing. We are currently very obsessed with what I call sort of horizontal comparisons. So for example, we have a discourse today that's obsessed with racism and sexism, whatever. Whatever those causes are, what we miss out is the vertical a compa compar comparison, which is kind of lost on us. And th this is where I'm, maybe I'm skeptical the post metaphysics thing and adding too many prefixes onto things because there's something called generationism that's hardly ever discussed simply because the people that we discriminate against when we're generationists are the ones that are dead, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so we say that any culture that existed before ours, any age before our own age is, is, is lower you know, compared to ours, like if that was generally true. And a lot of young people have been led to believe this because they're surrounded with so much information, especially with, you know, with a smartphone in your hand and you press a button and suddenly there's more information available to you than there wasn't the entire world in all the world's libraries 10 years ago. Yeah, that's true. But number one, most of it is junk. And number two, it's not in your head. <laughs> Just because available doesn't make the difference. And, and instead, what I get from my students is that they get really, really clever, you know, and they have the self-confidence you love them to have when they're like 23 years old and they walk up to you and they say, listen, okay, I know I'm like, I'm lucky in the sense that I live in an age where information is available to me to an extent that never existed before. But what did you do when you were 23 that I will lost out on? Because obviously 23 years is 23 years. There's only that amount of time every day you're awake. And then I say, well, I probably would have read about 10 times more books than you have when I'm 23. Because I didn't waste my time on computer games and I didn't waste my time on thinking just because I can surf on Wikipedia, name drop a few things, I've studied them. And then they got to go pale and then they realize, okay, so that would be like a clever thing for me to do compared to other 23 year olds, but to actually sit down and do deep studies and read tons of books. And I said, yes, you got it. I, I think there's a return to what I call digital monasteries and deep studies and turning off a lot of the online world and actually get a control of the online world and use it whenever it's good, but actually to go into the deep studies of getting deeply into, you know, philosophy and things and learning other languages and things that you don't do when you just sit and scroll on, on, in, in the online world. And what this is, this is to me today's wake up call against generationism. You are actually not more intelligent than previous generations were. You're at best on a par with them you know, because, you know, we love to have children that are smarter than ourselves, but we get drunk and we sleep with the wrong people and then we have stupid children anyway, and that's basically humanity. So the problem with this generationism is, is, is that I'm, I'm skeptical of the idea that there can be any sort of enhanced civilization without technological progress. And that technological progress in itself is not a guarantee for higher civilization at all as we become quite aware of these days, but rather to have a more timeless uh, look at what it means to be human allows us to have a more history-specific history view of technology. And this is why I'm throwing McLuhan into the mix here it, to compare him with Wilbur in the sense that I'm more satisfied with taking a more timeless approach to metaphysics with, with the addition that technology changes things over time. Actually, te technological changes is actually underrated. We study history. Yeah, I think that's all uh, quite valid. I would agree with all of that. I think the, uh, you know, in, in shifting away from talking about post-metaphysics towards something like a metaphysics of adjacency, one of the things I'm trying to do is put recent philosophical developments together with classical things, right? That's why I always put non-dualism in there with integrative and pluralistic thought, because a lot of it is classical transcendental things just being phrased in a slightly different way. But I think a lot of it also is this whole thing has to have applications to direct practice in terms of the cultivation of what we might call beingness. Right? And we need to understand that those are almost always based in encounters, whether it's the encounter with uh, the depth of uh, a philosopher whose writings you're reading, or whether it's the encounter uh, 
in a spiritual communion sense with someone who has more existential quality than you that you want to cultivate, or if it's the encounter between two hands that are brought closer together so that you can start to feel something like an energetic stimulation occur between them. So these are all conditions in which a, a closer coming together offers an existential transformation. I think that has to be at the heart of the kind of metaphysics we're thinking about, because it can't just be a description of the way the world looks now through digital technology, even though we need to absolutely harness that technology to make the world a better place. Now, we could throw out the digital for now. I agree with you completely. I, I would love to go back to Hegel because Hegel is a genius of simplifying things and then building complexity on that, which is how the world operates anyway. So in this case, what's interesting is comparing substance and subject. And, and you know, in today's language, that would be like, okay, so substance today, for most of us at least, would be the natural sciences. So we, we like to see, so how, what are the implications of our physics and biology, and, you know, psychology in its fundamental sense of the study of the human brain, how it collaborates with the body. And, and, and these are sciences, right? Natural sciences, that could be the substance aspect. The other aspect is the subject aspect, which is what, what does it mean to be human? What is a human existential condition? And we're all interested in here, all three of us, of course, are there similarities here in that case, what are those similarities? Because whenever you find analogies and metaphors, it's tempting to use them because it's, it's always a lot easier when you have a model you can apply on many different things because the people can learn the model once and then you can start applying on different things and that's much more knowledge. It's like multiple knowledge right away. There, of course, also the danger with that and that is that people take for granted that because they've learned to, to work with a certain metaphysics within a certain system, say the metaphysics of physics itself, then they think that is something they can then apply on the metaphysics of say the existential human condition. And then they start trying to apply it, you know, aggressively and actually they're talking about two totally different things. But this is why I'm interested in your work on adjacency because the kind of work that it was said because the membranic seems to be very similar here. We're working with borders. And we're working with what can we say about borders? And borders can be the border of a living cell, okay? And how that constitutes the first signal of a body of some kind. And what does it mean to be a body? What is a life form, for example? That could also be the human mind. It separates itself with three minds at least here. And these minds in themselves are probably quite schizophrenic. But, you know, we try to sort of talk about three different people here or two different senses of self to try to become a communication of some kind. And this becomes a podcast again. So the question here is, what brought you into the adjacency thing that you saw was lacking or, or that you wanted to resurrect from the world of philosophy? Eastern or Western doesn't matter when you started to try to, to build the metaphysics of adjacency? I think the things that I wasn't seeing enough of in Western philosophy, or at least the kind that I was exposed to and had delved into was a sense of generative thresholds. You know, I grew up on an island, so my awareness of the role of a beach as mediating between land and ocean and as a source of endless surprises and organic vitality is very strong. And my own personal spiritual practice and psychotherapeutic practice seem to be very oriented around relational conditions and relational conditions in which certain intensities were being allowed or disallowed. So it was a relational structure in which there was a fluctuating intensity in a betweenness. So that was sort of the background of my experience of the world and my experience of developmental self-practice. And I didn't see those being spoken of clearly enough in the philosophic systems that I was looking at. Even in, and, you know, even in something like Wilbur would say both and, right, as an alternative to either or. And I would look very closely at that slash between the two words. And I would think they're, they're still too far apart. They could get a little, the intensity of the adjacency could be maximized, could be amplified. They could get a little closer together. Is there an underlying assumption in that sort of, that in-betweenness, that almostness that's between them that I could get into more deeply in the same way I might want to uh, amplify my relational intensity with another human being, not by fusing with them, but by getting a little closer. I agree with that one. And, and here's where our work comes in because we are radical relationalists. 
So Seneca is not work between Hegel and Whitehead, if we name drop here. And, and probably that hopefully leads us to Derrida and Levinas later on in this conversation. But the hegel Whitehead thing is that we, we are convinced that Hegel's dialectic should be read today through Whitehead's relationalism. So just to point out what we mean here is that relations are prior to relata. And that is, of course, completely like counterintuitive because we like to think of the world in a Kantian sense that here's the subject and I'm observing a vase over there and that's an object. And inside my body, there's a subject and this little guy inside my head is watching this object and this relation between the two. Well, the problem with that world is that it's too stale, it's too fixed. That's what the world operates. The world is in, in constant flux. And once it's in constant flux, it's, it's not automatically given that the subject and the object and the relation between them is actually the first thing or the prior thing in any way at all. And it turns out, like Hegel said, you know, Hegel's argument against Kant is essentially that, no, 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 before there is a subject over relationship, which in itself, the relationship is prior to the subject and the object. The first thing is the relationship. But prior to that, there's project. Human beings cannot understand subject object. It won't happen unless there is an active project. Something is going on here where a human being with his body, like Heidegger would say, it's actively involved in something. So there's the project first. And once you realize the project is prior to subject object, the question is, what is the project then? Well, the project in itself, you can give it a name. You can call it a company you just started or, you know, you can have a little local Buddhist group to meet together for meditation. That's a project, but that's just a name you put on something afterwards, isn't it? So that's clearly a lot that you put on the relationship and the relationship is then prior. And what is great with looking at the world that way, White was of course incredibly important to quantum mechanics and quantum physics. Actually, I would say that he should have called it quantum organics if he would have asked, you know, but, but he was incredibly important because he's, he's radical, idea of understanding the world as relations, not as relata, and on, only understand relata as byproducts of these relations. To me, that was like a wake up call to go into psychoanalysis and to start to understand the existential condition of the psyche exactly the same way as the self is a byproduct of processes that are going on all the time. Many of them are with other human beings, many of them are eternal, some of them are external, and there must be a membrane between the two, which is certainly our skin, you know? But uh, these, these are the processes I'm really interested in. And I think we should be interested in we do philosophy. Yeah, Bruce has looked at the, a lot of the grammatical substructure of the different modes by which this could happen. And we've been talking about whether or not prepositions could be a uh, periodic table of adjacencies of the different ways of things being towards or with or near each other. So is yeah. that, yeah, you, you, we all come Bruce, but uh, pre, pre, uh, prepositions here, uh, I use, I work a lot with potentials rather than actualities. I don't know if there's similarities. I just want to wait for that. We can talk about it later. But Bruce, yes, please. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think I'll, I'll touch on that point too. And so looking back a little bit at our earlier discussion about, uh, you know, post-metaphysics and what one of the things that came for me out of our investigation to post-metaphysics was really beginning to take a look at what you could call, though I wouldn't really call it in a formal way, meta-metaphysics, in that there was an interest in, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> that American double. prefixes, yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, the, the point there is that you were talking about what is the metaphysics of science, what is the metaphysics of this and that. And I think even in integral, looking at post-metaphysics, it, it then kind of made implicit a certain kind of metaphysics that it didn't surface. And I was noticing that. I was noticing certain metaphysical privileging and focusing. I mean, yeah, privileging going on with, under the surface of what Wilbur was doing in object-oriented ontology and Whitehead's work, process work. I was also noticing different types of privileging of, of you could say, metaphysical philosophies, what I would eventually came called grammatical philosophies, whether it was process oriented or substance oriented or quality oriented or relation oriented. So something that was substance oriented, I was calling nounal. Wil Wilbur's focusing on perspectives, it was pronounal and it follows in the lineage of, of others taking, you know, pronouns as, as uh, generative uh, you know, uh, of, of different metaphysical spaces. And uh, 
Verbal, of course, is the process oriented. Adverbal is looking at modes um, and you see different modal emphases in Soriao and in, in Latour and other people. Um, preposition is looking mostly at relationships and starting with relationality um, and vectors of, of relation or, or the unfolding of the actual out of the potential. So one way to look at the prepositions is they preposition what is to come and they, they mediate along different kinds of borders and membranes, including between the potential and the actual. What, Bhaskar's work in, in leaning into and looking at what are the generative mechanisms that are making possible what's arising, that's a prepositional movement to lean into and, and, and uh, call out what is the, the potential that's, that's giving birth to the actual. So there's this, this mediating role, what, what Michelle Sayre calls, you know, like an, the angelic function um, of, of prepositions uh, or, you know, messengers between zones and between territories. Yeah, why I, got, why I got interested in it was, of course, because physics hasn't solved the question of potentials and actualities and, and they've left it like it's all physics when in reality, you know, I'm doing emergence vector theory a lot. So it's like, what are the meaningful divisions that we need to do between different fields of thought? Or where, where, where are habits in a certain area of the universe suddenly lost in another one? What is global? What is local in the universe? Things like that. And when you do emergence vector theory, one of the fun things here is to kill the idea that physics is primary as a science. Mm. And, and uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm that interested in some physics to be honest about it. The, you know, continuities probably are subphysical and then discretions, which we know the space-time exists of these days, for example, is probably what we then finally would leave for physics to deal with. But the fact that we can now for sure say that physics cannot be first science uh, is great because it strengthens the idea that you don't have to start somewhere like going back to Hegel's substance and subject. I hate reductionism, right, with the vengeance. And, and the problem is reductionism goes both ways. You either end up with, you're all going down to some kind of monadic atom of some kind that contains all the information about the universe, although it's infinitely small, which is like weird. But you have to end up there because everything else that comes afterwards has to be built from this one atom. It has to be developed from it, like if there was a plan in it or something like that. That is classical reductionism. But the problem is that panpsychism then threatens to be just reverse reductionism. It just said, well, the top of creation, again, this idea that we develop, the top of creation is consciousness. Very popular word in American English. <laughs> so there's consciousness, and because there's consciousness, then everything has to be sort of proto-conscious prior to consciousness suddenly popping up in history, which is like incredibly anthropocentric to begin with. It's even, it's even evil to humans because we're usually not conscious about what we do. We're more subconscious than conscious and consciousness may be a little luxury, a little spice that we put on top of things as an excuse for things that we do. But, but I want to get rid of both those to be able to just neutrally say, like, let's make it flat. And let's be able, for example, to say to a biologist and a physicist that we treat you on a par with one another and you can then explore where the adjacency is, for example, between your two different emergence vectors. It would probably then be chemistry, right? And that could in itself be a known emergence vector. It turns out the chemist has a lot of attributes and qualities about it that you can't really apply to physics or biology. Well, that motivates it to be called its own emergence vector. But to, just to arrive at that sort of flatness of what I'm trying to work with. And then, then you get to the real fun stuff. And that is the fiendishly the hardest thing ever to do in philosophy, which is to try to describe what an emergence is. <laughs> the ultimate challenge in philosophy is like Bergson says, Henri Bergson says, why is everybody obsessed with the question of why there's something rather than nothing, which by the way was Leibniz's quote and not Heidegger's originally. When Bergson said, well, the interesting thing if you're a philosopher and you're, you know, you're in this world and you try to make sense of it, is of course, why is there so much of everything and why is there difference in the first place? And that is where this whole thing with adjacency and membranics comes into the picture. What are the borders like and why do the borders work the way they do? And what can we possibly say generally about border areas? And what must we not say about generally because actually we lose it completely if we, if we try to find similar patterns for each border area that we study. Yeah, I agree that we need to... Um 
you know, we need to deprivilege physics in our thinking to some degree. And part of that privilege that it's accrued is from the human cognitive habit of using simple visual mapping of material objects so that I look at you and it looks like you have this very defined border. And my brain is simplifying the perception to make that true. Now, it is true the skin is operating, but it's also true that with a sensitive electrical instrument, I could take your heartbeat from 12 feet away right? because it doesn't, the border doesn't totally boundary a condition in an absolute sense. Right? So we have this habit of examining the physical world with our senses and our brain, which makes us think of things as totalized, independent uh, you know, autonomy units. When in reality, if you examine their boundary condition, it's always going to be both an exclusion and a permission. Uh, it's permeable as well as a boundary. It's always going to be flexing and changing and dynamic. And there's a not quiteness. There's an almostness at every boundary condition. And that's something I think that we can only think when we go beyond the, the thinking of physics that extends those very simplistic physical observations about material objects that we evolved to have. Yeah, and physics arrived at oscillation as a fundamental condition. It seems that lowest energy level always oscillates. <laughs> that's the one thing the superstring theory got right was that oscillation is fundamental. And then we, you know, we discover the world and we go, say, into biology. I, I, would, I would add here, I, I would add Marshall McLuhan and say, the reason why we've been so obsessed with physics over the last 100 years, because we come out of an industrial age where taming physical materials was absolutely essential. It was about iron ore and steel and things like that and building cars and shit. And also physics went through a massive revolution in the 20th century. It got attention. It was in the media. So we took for granted that physics must therefore be the primary science. I would say that we probably will make the same mistake in the 21st century, but this time around will be for biology because we'll be so obsessed with biology and we discover there's nothing out there in outer space. It's just cold, and, but this planet needs to be saved and fixed and it's full of life. And that's exactly why this planet is so exciting. And then suddenly synthetic biology comes along and we do gene editing and, and we're obsessed with everything we can do with that. And then we go into this same mistake, but this time around biology will be primary science. And what we're trying to do here is of course to, just to remind people that let's try to avoid to make those mistakes. Probably we can't, but you know, let's try to avoid to make them because each emergence factor, including consciousness or mind, should be respected as equal with all the other ones. I'd like to look at like something like Uxkul's, you know, von Uxkul's ethology, for instance, and looking, that's important to membranics and it's important to adjacency, I think, and to my concept of generative enclosures, slaughter dikes bubbles, um, even um, Deleuze and Guattari's work um, on deterritorialization. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting. You know, he's been an influence. One of the things that uh, Lehman and I have talked about in terms of my integral grammatology, the different metaphysical or grammatical philosophies that have informed different eras of thought, and, and they're not absolute. They repeat and they cycle and they, they, they get different emphases at different times. And what looks like is happening right now is a move towards a privileging of adverbial or prepositional approaches, the, the modal and the relational. And Whitehead is a good intersection of, of modal and relational thinking. But in, in Uxkul, what he did is he, he moved from the whatness, the nounal whatness of taxonomy over towards an adverbial focus on the where and the how. And he's looking at you know, an organism in its milieu, um, it, where it is and how it interacts uh, is what creates this, the bubble, you know, um, of, of its meaning space, of its enacted world. And it, it forms its own membrane in which it mediates what kind of perceptions are relevant and not relevant. And it, it you know, of course, they're, they're mutually interactive and interactive between organism and environment. There's not the organism here and the environment there, but they're co-constituting and, and, and co-informing, right? So I think that, that Uxkul's framing of, of biology in those modal or adverbial terms then went on to influence people like Sloterdijk and later his, inver you know, his concepts of immunity and, and bubble and foam space <laughs> and also what Deleuze and Guattari are doing. And there's kind of a tension between 
you know, um, slaughtered Ike looking more at the conservative function of the inclusive exclusivity of a bubble that, that creates immunological zones for organisms to, to survive and thrive. And Deleuze and Guattari looking at the opening up, the deterritorialization, deter the flow of affects across boundaries, right? So, I, but they're both actually looking at what I would call generative enclosure dynamics. There's the, the generative enclosure of that, of the umwelt, of the, of the bubble. Within the bubble, there's the disclosure. There's the enactment of world spaces by the boundaries, the membranes you draw. And then there's the act of disenclosure of the opening towards um, new forms. And so it, it, to me, there's a dialectical movement and dance among those things, but there's a, a important seed, I think, in, in Uxko's work. Oh, yeah. And we should say that U-E-X, because it's one of the hardest spelled names in the world of philosophy. <laughs> Estonian guy, probably, or something like that. But anyway, yeah, I, I agree completely. And, and I think this is like the death of the philosopher who we are, in the sense that Heidegger was like the last guy who asked those sort of existential questions. And since then, yeah, we're byproducts and byproducts and byproducts of all kinds of relations, you know, and doesn't mean we don't have freedom and choice and things like that too. We can study those if we want to, but you know, leave that to its own emergence factor. We can put it there in the world of ethics or whatever. But what's really interesting here is that I agree with you completely that the, 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 the 20th century was the opening to uh, of, of a philosopher where we are. That's where Slaughter Dyke and Deleuze and Guattari is certainly what they share in common. This was also, of course, the philosophy in North America. It started with Charles Saunders Peirce. And in, this, in pragmatism, American pragmatism, is certainly it's obsessed with where we are. And it talks about, you know, it's, it's spatial temporal. What I'm interested in is then to add the when. But I'm perfectly happy to go with the who. I find that to be the least interesting question <laughs> to philosophers. I think who we can leave to identity politics in its vulgar form. And its more advanced form, we can leave it to artists and see what they express when they play around with the who thing. But, but you know, leave that to cultural or artistic expression. But philosophers, it's, it's not a very interesting question. Like not even Nietzsche really dealt with it. It's, when you misunderstand Nietzsche and think vulgarly about Nietzsche, then you think he's obsessed with himself, but it really never was. But the where thing opens up to the when thing, and it's between the where and the when thing, adjacency again, that I think all the interesting things happen. For example, in physics or subphysics, we work on a model of a second time dimension, which is hyper temporality. So th th think of a time without space at all. And if, if there's something prior to the Big Bang, obviously there was, then that would be, have to be hyper temporal. Hyper temporality has many other advantages for scientists as well. It's like a time that is the same time everywhere in the universe at any given time. Only hyper temporality could have that quality. S spatial temporality cannot do that. But the thing is that it, it liberates the spatial temporal that Einstein was obsessed with, it liberates that from the idea that it has to be all forms of time. So it's like a Bergsonian difference between time and duration we can talk about here. It's called global time and local time. We talked to physicists about this, right? So Einstein was right about everything, but all the time he ever talked about was space time. But the great thing with that is that space time can have discrete qualities fundamentally. Space time can be, for example, a, like, a, a, like almost like a wallpaper on something on which everything else can dance. All it requires is mass. As soon as you add mass to the equations, you get the universe we're living in right now, undeniable living, the, the sort of universe that our physical instruments are, are colliding with and, and operate when we do classical physics, for example. But then with these really funny, weird things pop up in quantum physics, like entanglement, but you know, it's not that it's different from classical physics, it's an entirely different emergence vector. And these things are undeniably the case. Entanglement absolutely occurs constantly, by the way. So there has to be things that are completely ignorant of space. <laughs> and, and then you have to hook them up to something and the idea that with hypertemporality is you can hook them up to hypertemporality. Now, once I, I work with these things, of course, then I love to go and see these membranics can we then play with them when it comes to the existential condition of what it means to be human, which in my case is a study of society. I prefer to do social analysis, not psychoanalysis. It's much more interesting. It's much more interesting to study tribes and populations and nations and empires throughout history. And, you know, we're, we're social creatures anyway, so it pays off. That's what human beings, the way they should be studied. When you study human beings as a social creature, then the question is, how many of these ideas apply here? 
Well, it turns out that we also view the world as potentials. We know the vast majority of potentials never occur. For example, if half a million sperms are trying to attack an egg and get inside of it, at the most, one of them will succeed. All the other ones are fucking losers. We can throw them out through the dustbin of history. So history is full of potentials that never materialize. And apparently nature doesn't care too much about it, thankfully. But the relationship here between potential and actualities actually makes sense for us as human beings too. And we, we can then write narratives about ourselves as tribal creatures when we can use these same ideas. There could be an implicate order prior to an emergence. Suddenly an emergence occurs what was just accidentally habits before the emergence become laws afterwards and rules and regulations we have to abide with. And our identities are somehow both connected to the implicate prior to an emergence, for example, our own birth, and the explicate following after that. We're born, we, we're out on our own, we're no longer in the womb, we have to live with that. So I find that very fruitful. I'd um, like to just, yeah. I only want to throw in a two second comment before you, you join here, and that is, just in speaking about that focus on the where, when, and the spatiotemporal, for me, that is exactly prepositional thinking because prepositions trace relationships in time and space. They're temporal relations and they're spatial relations. That's what a preposition looks at, and that's the kind of vectors it tra they, they trace. Yeah, there's the, uh, uh, the, the prepositional structure of the word next is interesting because there's a next to spatially and there's a next in terms of moments. So those are two different adjacencies that come into play. But I want to track back over your pronoun questions and then come back up to entanglement because there's a, there's a real McLuhan angle in terms of the philosophers who thought about who am I because that's, that's the reader of the book is the who who's being inquired into. And when we go past that into a new technological domain, that question becomes a little bit less relevant. We, we, should, we, should add, we should just add here that the guy who read a book prior to the printing press is probably just a little nerdish monk sitting somewhere in a corner and everybody forgot about him. And yeah. suddenly books became cheap and widely available. And then the reader with the night lap reading his book becomes the center of the universe. And then yeah. you get all the Heidegger's of the target world. of the modernized book production system is the who who's being inquired into. So we get this shift into a where, which is where are we, but also where do we look when this touches back at what Bruce was saying. I thought of, uh, you know, the, one of the things Deleuze has to say about Nietzsche is that Nietzsche emphasizes the question, which one is it, rather than the question, what is it? It's in his book, Nietzsche and Philosophy. And the question of which one is it is an inherently uh, relational, plural, and blurred context in which you need to tease apart something amongst a multitude. So he's describing where we look. And we look in a place where, uh, you know, if you make a difference or you make a sameness, you say, these are not the same, these are the same, or maybe I'm going to integrate these, or maybe I can compare them in some way. We're looking at the same thing. We're looking at that syntactical boundary condition. That's the, that's the awareness, the territory of the examination that's common to all those types of discriminations. Now, the when, I think, is really important because it's very easy to have a static concept of relationality, right? where my hands have a relationship to each other, but that's not what's interesting. That's not what's dynamic. It's there's a point in the process of their coming closer together, which creates an activation of some kind, just as it does between two lovers or between two subatomic phenomenon. So it's a moment in the process of the adjacency. So it's not enough to just think in terms of an image of a relational context. That's a dynamic situation in which there are moments that have different significances. And when it comes yeah, up... And I, yeah, and I agree here. This is, this is actually fantastic to go back to the natural sciences because the only way to try to explain it is to say that, yeah, different, there are different fields. And, and the weird thing with fields is that they're everywhere if they're somewhere. So they're, they're sort of, they're, they're, they're definitely hypertemporal, right? So the, 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 the funny thing that with the fields is that the only way to describe that something happens is when two fields somehow interact. So relationalism doesn't have to be fundamental anyway. It's, not, it's perfectly fine to leave reductionism. Yeah. Relations yeah. occur in any world that is meaningful to us. Yes. So the reason why I'm, uh, why I'm adamant about relationalism is that I'm not explaining the origin of the universe by being a relationalist. I'm just saying that in, that's why also I'm provocative is saying I love the subphysics skills, physics is first science, but I'm not really that interested in because from a human perspective, 
Subphysics is probably the least interesting emergence vector I could think of. Just, just think of it like, the thing with membrane theory is that I started studying it doing superstring theory in the 1990s. And then I discovered that maybe they're all wrong. Maybe it's just not in hyperspace you got the membranes, but rather it's hypertemporal. And if it's hypertemporal, it doesn't say that much about superstring theory, but membrane theory, M theory as it's called, speaks a lot more about actually how potentials operate as oppositional to actualities. And the great thing with that is that you could just basically say that, okay, so if you don't have mass, then you can't really say that there's any space at all because space is meaningless without mass. Now, if there's a prior and an after, again, the now and the next, that means there has to be some kind of time. It's a requirement there must be some kind of duration, but it cannot be measured because you don't have a clock to measure with because clocks are made of mass. Even Roger Penrose agrees strongly on this one and loves this idea. So then the thing is that the, the fields themselves on their own, it's weird to think they don't have a space to exist within because they're only qualities of something that still doesn't have an actuality. That's exactly why they're not that interesting. But when they do collide, it could have been a big bang, but probably was more likely a big bounce. But it had a more big bang like character than people think because it wasn't that the previous universe imploded. It's rather that it was so diluted that the mass disappeared with only photons left. Because only photons left, it didn't make any sense for the universe to think of itself as spatiality at all. And that's exactly why it started again. <laughs> it's Roger Penrose's radical idea in cycles of time, and I think it's beautiful. But, but what it does is that it just emphasizes that it's only when potential fields or fields of potentiality collide with one another or interact with one another that you get relations. But these relations are then everything else. They're everything else in the universe. So they start right there. And maybe we could eventually declare that that's the birth of physics. The birth of physics starts with primary relations, the first relations. And then everything is relations of relations. And the trick then is to keep white to the mind is that to remember that all the relations that concurrently exist that are synchronous affect one another. And then you get a really mind blowing idea that David Bohm first dug into the 1950s that he called the holoverse. And the holoverse is then everything synchronically in the universe at any given time. But the problem is, <laughs> It's so damn hard to define the moment. <laughs> what is it now? <laughs> so you, you're left stuck with adjacency. You're left stuck with that because you have to sort of, well, what does it mean for humans to be a now? And it turns out in psychological experiments that the vast majority of people think of it as an eight second period. Think of like four seconds uh, prior and four seconds after to something happening, then somehow we can think of that as a now. Well, that's just phenomenologically the case in large studies of populations, but it's not a you know a relevant philosophical answer to the question of what is a now. But that's exactly why the now is, is is really the ultimate philosophical question. What is now? And then what is next? The next now. The uh, I think the job of philosophy, one of its jobs is to think the preconditions for physics rather than take physics at face value. And I think entanglement is one of the areas where I'm fascinated because when we normally think about adjacency or proximity, we normally think about it in a simple spatial manner. But what entanglement shows us is that nearness can be very counterintuitive in some conditions. Like we might even be able to revive Einstein's complaint. Einstein argued for a local realism as the fundamental nature of science that he felt quantum physics was interfering with. But if we can say that when two things are entangled, they are near each other, that they can transfer information and energy you back. Just, you just gave us a perfect example of why the term <laughs> hypertemporality is so useful, because you can't say that they're spatiotemporally near if they're a million light years away from one another. And still entangled, yeah. but you can say they're high temp, hyper temporal in here. So That's what we need the word hyper temporal. You can't, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot even grasp or understand entanglement yeah. unless you have that term hyper temporality there. And yeah. again, it's a philosophical term the physicists will eventually have to get used to. We've got to, um, in my way of thinking, I'm liberating the concept of nearness from the constraint of normal spatiotemporal thinking. Yeah. And that, that, that is the term that we use, hypertemporally 
close us. Or, well, it or comes near. to the notion of the now, right? There are phenomenological, there's a whole scale, right? People will say there's eight seconds, but we also know if you look at a brain, how long it takes for your brain to organize incoming perceptions into a sequence, like the length of time it takes in order to process something as occurring in time, right? And those are not necessarily philosophically satisfying, but they do, they all show a certain kind of looping. I think Hagland, Martin Hagland describes it as a constitutive deferral, right? He reads that out of Derrida and Heidegger, where you're always going to slightly miss the present moment, but we can take that as part of the fundamental architecture of what the present moment is. So it slightly slips past itself as its own structure. So yeah. it's, it's always almost itself. It's adjacent to itself at a fundamental level. So, for example, we wrote the synthesis books, Jan Sedekist and I, we used this in a more artistic way. And we wanted to describe what the ultimate ecstatic experience could be like. Like, neutrally, again, I mean, it's certainly part of religion and spirituality, but, you know, ecstatic experiences, well, they're the peak experiences of your life. And if you're smart and wise, you, 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 you don't stay within them, but you memorize them and you can always return to them. And of course, the, these experiences create enormously strong bonds. Anybody that's a good sex would know. Anybody seeing their child being born would know probably. It's just like, yeah. And a lot of people take as psychedelics would certainly experience that. And these, and we try to come up with a term that made sense of that. And the great thing then with art is that when you took two, Two things that are absolute, are absolute contradictions of one another put into the same word. You really get a good word. And some of people say, yeah, that's a good one. And we call it the infinite now. <laughs> and of course, it doesn't make any sense. Exactly. And still, when you hear the term the infinite now, it makes sense. Because if you've ever been in a real ecstatic peak experience, especially if you shared it with somebody, it's like a deep spiritual experience. And, and it has this quality about it, like, I can't stay here. This is too overbearing. But since I'm not going to stay here, I know I'm going to come out of this experience. I can enjoy it and I should, and I can immerse myself in it to then memorize it as if I could tell my grandchildren about it and certainly remember it when, the day I die. And it will make my entire life meaningful. It's like, it was like paint my entire life with meaning because I've had that experience and I could potentially have similar experiences again. And, and that's exactly the way, because now there's, it's an abstraction. It sounds like the most concrete thing we ever could think of, but all we can, all we can register is that we experience certain ego momenta, you know, and we know that ADHD people have the advantage, they experience them quicker than other, everybody else does, you know, so, so we know it's not, even, it's not even the same for most people. This is like an average of the eight second span to experience it now, but, but that's what's great about it. And, and, and I love it is that, I love this, what we call the principle of explanatory closure. For example, uh, anything that is expanded out of the universe so far away from us today that it, it can never reach us because it's now expanded gradually to the point where the speed of light means it's so far away from us going to experience it. And a large part of the universe actually has that quality to it. Well, that's just there are areas of the universe that we cannot know anything about. So we have to accept that there is an explanatory closure. And I think it's the same thing we come to the now. I'm, I'm not, I haven't given up on the emergence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it has a very similar quality because it is so incredibly important to kill reductionism. But, but when it comes to now, I think we can all agree that the now is something that escapes us all the time. Tartong Tolku has a great phrase, which he says, be here now is a great idea, except almost nobody knows what is meant by be or here or now. <laughs> uh -oh. um, but I wanted to talk about something related, you know, Several times, Lehman has been talking about this, you know, drawing near, and and, and we're talking about also that that merger into uh, the dissolution of boundaries and that 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 overwhelming excess of the now. Um, and I was thinking of a couple things, but one of them is in you know Deleuze and Guattari when they're talking about becoming animal, and it's when you get into that zone of maximal proximity it becomes a zone of indeterminacy in which becoming eventuates. And it's a, it's a practice of drawing near in order to allow for the becoming of animal, becoming minor. We could, we could extend that out into other domains. So I think that's really important. And I, I connect that also to Sloterdijk's negative gynecology, where he talks about, you know, historically we've, you know, meditated on the vulva, you know, and 
the, the merger into the mother matrix is this merger into a, a, a space where the senses are overwhelmed and you're in this complete immersion state, uh, you know, immersion of, of, of presence and nowness and the immediacy of what's unfolding and a loss of, of boundaries, uh, you know, kind of the, the unbounded wholeness that, that Bohm or, or Dzogchen or other thing, you know, traditions describe. And with negative gynecology, Slaughter Dyke is recommending <laughs> at the, on the one hand, part of us enters into the mother matrix, you know, goes into the womb, experiences that loss of boundary and, and, and that dissolution and that becoming in that zone of maximal proximity that Deleuze and Guattari talk about. But at the same time, part of us remains outside and observes what's happening. And that is the part of us that begins to understand what is the relationality before relata. You know, how can we understand the emergence of, of dyadic and, and multiplistic tribo <laughs> poetic forms? Um, how do we understand? Yeah, what, you know, so you need to take, you need both gestures at the same time. The, 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 the willingness to emerge, uh, you know, to merge into the mother matrix and, and that dissolution and the, the part of us that, that stands apart and is able to observe and call forward now in our, our new emerging metaphysics, you know, the, the relationalism of generative enclosures, of metaphysics of adjacency, of integral grammatology, of syntheism, all the different kinds of things that are focusing on these things right now. Yeah, and we're dealing with them all the time. I mean, psychoanalysis is full of adjacencies. It's all about the adjacencies. It's just like you got the womb first matrix and, and we have no clue. We're just, we just, we, what Sigmund Freud kind of, he, he, he was sort of, sort of, he talked about the oceanic feeling. So it's like, you know, you long back into the womb. Well, that's okay. I think for temporarily we need it now and then. I mean, you go to bed at night and you sleep in the bed. It's, it's you know, you take a bath, a bathtub is a womb. So, you know, especially with a good friend or a lady or something, whatever. But, you know, it, it, it could be a nice place to go. But the, the, we, create, we create these wombs, these matrixes, as we call them. We have these matrixes everywhere. And they're all about adjacency and intimacy. And, and the way, say, Yulia Kristeva, while talking about Derrida and the French great post-structuralist, I mean, Kristeva is, is great with this work in understanding that birth is really for the mother to understand that the mother and the baby are two different things. Because we crawl by instinct straight to the tit, start sucking the tit the first thing we do, we're adjacent to the female body again in the sense that we think we're unified with it, but the mother understands the baby and, and her are different things, at least. All the women try to keep the baby as close as they possibly can and try to unify with it anyway. As Chris Deva says, it's now impossible because birth just occurred. And then about a year later, but the phallic intrusion is the, is the time when actually Kristeva was the one, not Freud, not Lacan. Kristeva was the one who said, contrary to what we might think, especially in the male fantasy, it's not the strong woman who pushes away the child and teaches the child to be out there on its own. It's actually the child internally that has to internalize that I've got to get away from this. This is too close. Again, it's too forceful. It's too much of a jesse because I cannot survive if I don't get away from it. You know, most psychologists would probably say, well, you've got a tooth in your mouth, so you can't suck the tit any longer. That's like the more formal version of it. But in psychoanalysis, this is like, no, 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 no. There's a phallus that just came in through the door. Phallus is not mamilla. Mamilla needs to go away because I can no longer eat mamilla. And actually, my mother's mamilla is so disgusting to me now. So I will never, ever look at a woman that has a mamilla that's similar to that one. I will always look for women who have different mamillas in this way because I hate it. And, and Kristeva is the one who says, this is the first time in life we need to learn how to hate. So the most loved object we could ever think of that we're so adjacent to, the tit, is something that will push away and never, ever want to see again in our lives. And that abjection, the object there to Kristeva, is absolutely necessary for us to survive. Problem is later in history, of course, we use objection, for example, to create lynch mobs and kill people we don't like and things like that. And that is, of course, what Rene Girard, I think, is a later deal with. But I don't think unless Kristeva had made that opening in the 1980s, I don't think Girard would have come along 20 years later and basically written a book about lynch mobs and things at all. Because I think Kristeva's break is fundamental to, to understanding adjacency and how we deal with it how we want that intimacy and then we want to push it away. And, and wisdom is to learn how to go in and out of these adjacencies. Yeah, to take responsibility for that relational uh, adjacent condition. And it has, 
a generative element to it, like you're saying with the mother and the child and the formation of the independent psyche. It also has an aspirational version that we find in a lot of high mystical systems where the Sufis talk about a devotional non-dualism. The reason I worship God as another or the beloved is because there is no fundamental difference between myself and the beloved. But the form in which that takes is the form of my preposition-like orientation toward the other. Or uh, Dogen in Japan says, you, you do not sit down and meditate in order to become the Buddha. You sit down and meditate because you are the Buddha, which is to say the, the form of the completeness is present in the proper orientation toward, in the drawing nearer to the completion. The completion is itself active. This is where Hegel comes into the picture. That's why Hegel is, is the fundamental relationalist in Western philosophy. So I agree with you completely on that one. Yes, absolutely. And, and to just bring it on to membranic stuff. Mem membranics is, I think it's simpler uh, in, in the way that membranics is just how can a system figure out by having an externality and internality? And they occur in nature, for example, through lipids. So you got a little fat out there, you will have an outside inside. And membrane means that things do pass through it, but it takes an effort for things to pass through it. Now, that can, like Deleuze Guattari wrote a lot about this, this happens naturally in, 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 in nature everywhere. But when it comes to life forms, it's specifically tied to memory. So some kind of memory has to exist for a life form to exist. And what then happens is that things go in and out. Basically, it's like, yeah, I want to get nutrition and entertainment in. And then anything I'm bored with and this becomes shit, I want it out. Hopefully somebody else out there can use it instead. And that's why we have these relations, for example, with scumbags in nature that eat corpses and things, because otherwise we couldn't be allowed to do these sort of membranic traits that we do. But once you understand membranics as a fundamental concept in, say, a life form, you can then understand membranics is very, very useful for just about everything else. I give you a perfect example of that. It, a very sensitive issue today is nationalism. And with that goes, for example, the border between the United States and Mexico. And you got a very, very infected discourse in America where some people look away and other people look too much at it, whatever, like if it's the biggest thing in the world ever. But you've got like two camps fighting about, is, the, is, the, is there a border to begin with? In that case, is it protected and orderly done? Or maybe it's just locked completely, nobody can get in. All these arguments, all this entire discourse is about membranics. Because undeniably, there has to be membranes. Um, I mean, if you're a beautiful girl and you walk into a bar, you don't want everybody to rape you, do you? No, <laughs> you should be perfectly allowed to say no to guys you don't want to sleep with. You have a membrane. No, I don't let you in, literally, I've got a pussy here, but I will let somebody else in maybe, or maybe a woman, you know, but I, uh, I become who I am because I'm membranic. And this is why, for me, th this is a break when discussing nationalism and getting over the different divides is to understand it. Yeah, but there got to be some kind of border somewhere here. And we often use nature, for example, the ocean, to help us set up a border. And with, between Canada and America, it's, it's, it's more random. But you have these borders. And if you don't have borders in your life, nothing will work. The question is, one, which ones do you have? And then you can look through history and discover that it's almost like we imitated the human body when we built the first cities. And we built them like, you know, we had these walls around them to protect us because the outside world was full of nomads sitting on horses who would storm into anything and rape it and pillage and like, like Vikings, for example. So we better protect this place. Like we had women and children inside of it and it became our own little place. So we built these bathtubs or wombs essentially and we, we put up walls around them. And once we'd done that and did it successfully, we discovered after a while that, you know, the wisest person in the entire community was probably on the one we put in charge of being the guard at the gates. And that would be a person who'd been expert at adjacency. Like you would have somebody come up to you and say that, I want to get inside. Yeah, do you have any papers or documents to do that? It's more of the bureaucratic version of it. Probably you know the latest out there say, yeah, I'll come look at you. I'll see straight through you. I know who you are. You're allowed in, but only for a day. Or, yeah, you're allowed in permanently. The women will love you, whatever. Or, or, no, you're not allowed in at all, actually. Or, we have too many of you ready, so off you go. So, this is membranics. Social membranics. You know, you got a nightclub. 
I, I love studying nightclubs. So I find VIP lounges ridiculous, but they seem to work. And the reason why they work is a deep philosophical question to me when I do membranics. Yeah, I think that, I mean, the membrane is what operates the adjacency, right? I often say the separator is the connector, meaning the same structure is doing both jobs, which is at once a philosophical claim and a practical claim and a non-dualist claim. And how do you do that? I think you have to fundamentally uh, de-reify the notion of the the absoluteness of the distinction, right? If you were to take 100% and 0% off the table, then you have an area in which there has to be a negotiation, there has to be a decision, there has to be an enactment of wisdom. No, no boundary is ever going to be a complete boundary, and you're never going to have no boundary at all. If you have a complete boundary or no boundary, not only is it not going to work, but those conditions are essentially impossible to ever enact. So you have to have a wise boundary, which is some kind of calculation where it's never totalized, either at zero or 100. It's always, it's always a negotiation of the degree of the adjacency in the given enactment. Any kind of uh, membranic closure, I would say, is generative, though it can become degenerative over time. If, uh, if, if it's not uh, healthily enacted, if it, it becomes too porous or if it becomes too closed, um, then it moves towards degeneration and, 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 and decay and loss and ultimately a disintegration, a, a disenclosure, right? But uh, I think it's uh, Nancy Tuana. She talks about vis viscous porosity. She's looking at, for instance, what's happening with Hurricane Katrina and how social dynamics and nature and architecture and city planning and racism all intersect to create what became the effects of, of Hurricane Katrina. And she talks about that as a viscous porosity, that there are membranes around these different domains that, that, that affect how they interact, but they do interact, and that there is this entangling of the outer and the inner in different ways that, that um, are sometimes generative and sometimes destructive. So I think that's like part of Sloterdijk's also immunity is how do we tend to the membrane function to produce the most generative conditions that can create like what uh, Lehman talks about is, you know, the excess, um, the excess of, of the integration that allows for, um, you know, the flourishing of creativity and productivity and well-being. I agree. And this is why membranics is good in the sense that you probably find opposed political sites in North America when it comes to studying Hurricane Katrina and the U.S.-Mexico border. But both sites could understand each other much better by just understanding as membranic things that they're discussing. And I, I think if you lived in a small town of the Middle Ages, if the old woman who was the great guard died, it could have been disastrous. You know, the, whoever replaced her, you, 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 the membrane was no stronger than the guard. And, and the same thing with our bodies, you know, that's what health is all about. You know, if you, if you lose, if you get poisoned, for example, there's just bad membranics. So, so it's a good way of doing uh, the problem of borders. And, and by the way, Lehman, I should point out the reason why we say membrane, not borders, precisely because it does let things through. It is, it's organic. It's not stuck yeah. because we know that any, any wall that is just permanently stuck would just be idiotic. It sort of occurs to me thinking post-politically that the adverbial approach to philosophy that Bruce was discussing has a role here because the membrane can be considered in different styles, right? I can approach it feelingly or thinkingly because I think one of the arguments in the United States is between people who want to analyze what kind of membrane we should have and enact through policy with the U.S.-Mexico border and a lot of other people who want to hear that borders are being taken seriously. And they're not very interested in the specifics because everybody pretty much agrees we should have a healthy membrane there. They don't really know what that means. Some people wanna hear their leaders give them the feeling that the membrane is operating and other people wanna hear what the policy is to make the membrane actually operate. So those are different adverbial modes. Cool, yeah, I agree on that one. So. When it comes to these two terms that we love, adjacency and membranics, this, this is today's conversation. Um, where do these two philosophies, as I call them, where do they fit in with each other? We, we might go into emergence here the last few minutes we've got left for today, but you know, it's, um, 
Does membranics help for you to do philosophy adjacency better? I think where it helps me is that it um, makes me more focused on the concept of responsibility uh, for the operations that occur within the adjacent space. And I think that the membrane is a notion of doing that adjacency well and of someone making a wise decision at each moment within that process. I would say that adjacency is a fantastic term that I would love to use, for example, in teaching Tantra to couples that do love each other and want to get even more intimate and more serious about the relationship. No, Membranics, I think Membranics is a term I use more for the social. It's more like politically useful or, 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 or you know, here's a tribe, here's a subculture, here's, for example, a Facebook forum. Now, how do you moderate that? Who's allowed in? Who must go out? Whatever. That's membranics. So, so membranics is, is generally very, very useful, especially for, for dealing, dealing with people, how you organize things. For you. I, I think almost everything we see today is too romantically disorganized. It, you know, it brags about being decentralized, like Occupy Wall Street. These things, they fall apart instantly because they basically have terrible membranics. <laughs> so Bruce and I That's do one of the series we do for the integral stage is an integral sexuality series. So I've interviewed, I don't know, two dozen people or something like that now. And there's a few things that almost all of them who are coming at it from different angles, sexual alchemy, Tantra, you know, Buddhism, health, all that kind of stuff. The, the role of healthy boundaries, they all emphasize that. They also all emphasize the need to slow down your sexual experience at certain points. Right? And the, what you do when I think what's implied by that piece of advice that they're all giving is setting you up to encounter these adjacency thresholds where a more intense, more coherent experience and even peak experiences are possible at these boundary conditions of intensified nearness. That if we jump past it, if we miss the nearness point, we actually miss the very thing we wanted from the experience. I agree strongly on that one. How about you, Bruce? Last words. <laughs> I had something that was lingering in my mind from an earlier thought. I, I didn't know is historically if you have any thoughts on the difference between what happened in, in Buddhism and Jainism. And they were both basically at the similar at a similar they were they were contemporary. And within Jainism, we have the development of the notion of anekantavad where it's, you know, the wheel of perspectives and the need to basically mediate among intersecting systems and, and, and see how they interface, trace out how they interface and that th they need to be all held at the same time. Buddhism did not really attempt the same thing to try to mediate multiple cultural conflicting philosophical and cultural social systems at the same time, whereas Jainism did. And I don't know if, if either of you have any thoughts historically on that, like what, what possibly... Uh, I, I, would, I would say that if you think of them as three different religions, and they add Zoroastrianism, it gets really interesting, especially Zoroastrianism has influenced Tibetan and Chinese and Japanese Buddhism enormously. So uh, I, the way to deal with that, if you think process radically all the way through, and I've never, felt, I've never experienced a system that did that so properly as Jainism did, that is reincarnation after reincarnation after reincarnation all the time. So if there are any differences, one loop of the process at all, even a tiny small one, like Gilles Deleuze points out, then that makes a difference and you can make something out of that. Now, I don't think human beings would ever have seen that at all, that the tiny little difference could make a difference in itself before we had written language. And that's why I think these, these teachings arrive with written language. So we're asking them first, and the later Buddhism and Jainism. And basically they, they, they throw out all previous religions of different gods, or, which was basically just ancestors or whatever, threw that out and just thought of the world like radically in a new way. And they discover that, okay, so either it is process and all you do in written language is just you basically recognize that process comes after process comes after process, which I call a matrical religion. You have a religion that takes the feminine completely radically all the way, and that's Jainism. So it's a very credible position for me. But then you take Buddhism, Buddhism says, well, you can get out of the loop. And, and yeah, it's not really nirvana, probably moksha it means you find extinguish yourself, you no longer exist. So you can get out of the loop. Whereas Surastis says, yes, you can get out of the loop. And by the way, you should get out of the loop 
And by getting out of the loop, you die. And hopefully by the time you die, you're passed on the torch to another generation that could make the world different from what it was before. And that little idea with Zoroastrianism, the little tweak that's different Buddhism, is the beginning of the West eventually, because it, it is from Persia, you eventually get these ideas, some of them completely ridiculous, like Akhenaten's rule during Egypt and Stalin and Hitler, you know. But we do get the idea that the son's world can be different from the father's. And I would say in a McLuhanite way, I think Zoroastrians are correct in the sense that, yeah, because we accumulate information, we could possibly create a wiser world and we can certainly do it with more technologies. And yeah, those technologies might kill us or they might make the world better. Yeah, but that's a risk I'm willing to take because to me, the only credible alternative to that is the Buddhist one. But really, I just, yeah, I'm getting out of the loop and extinguishing myself because it's the eternal return of the same and I'm not going to be part of the next return. And, and uh, the, the interesting thing is that once you study them in India, they're all three incredibly credible alternatives. It's basically a matter of taste, you know, what you're most adjacent to, that you decide to become a Parsi in India or you become a Jainist or a Buddhist. And these three minorities in India work really well together, which mm -hmm. again is proved that they actually are part of the same philosophy. Right. The only thing I'd add to that is uh, it's different with different forms of Buddhism. For example, I think there's a lot more wheel of perspectives type thinking in the Tibetan style. And that's partly because it is adjacent to the Indian tradition, right? So it's thinking of itself as another turning of the wheel, which is already a set of different types of Buddhist philosophies. There's a historical event where the Tibetan king is going to decide which way to go religiously, whether he's going to go into a more Chinese Zen style or a more Indian style. There's also a you know, great proliferation of mandalas and things like that. So I think the Tibetan and Vajrayana style of Buddhism has much more of the wheel of perspectives in it than, say, Indian Hinayana style. Oh, but the, the, the Vajrayana element of enlightenment here is where you get the Persian thinking that's mm -hmm. coming into the picture. So if you have a Zoroastrian and a Vajrayana Buddhist discussing enlightenment, then the Zoroastrian says, don't worry about the enlightenment. It will come anyway. It's called death. <laughs> and so just go out there and do shit so like Zoroastrians are like doers and they're of course incredibly wealthy in India and, and they do technology it, you know there's a common last name in Mumbai that's engineer and anybody's called like Simon engineer is definitely a Zoroastrian <laughs> so they embrace the Bronze Age thing the, it's obvious it's, it's one of the three that is the Bronze Age religion Buddhism and Jainism come later but I find it incredibly Credible, and this, of course, what Varayana is, is, is the hybrid between Zoroastrianism and Buddhism. So is Sufism, by the way. It has pre Islamic origins, yeah. and it has a shared Zoroastrian Buddhist origin. You can talk to any Kurdish Sufi, they would they completely say that, yeah, it is, it, it's that, it, it is that really Kushan and the Kushan Empire in northern India is where you have those things where they bred with each other through the Silk Road. One thing that we didn't talk about, and maybe we can do it later, I think it's just a footnote here, but that looking at uh, membranics adjacency and the concept of generative enclosure is basically the relationship to mandalic thinking and what's going on with the enactment of a mandala. That's next episode. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a few ideas. That's a perfect cliffhanger, bros. <laughs> Wonderful. Remind me of that one. If you guys want to do another one, I'm all for it. And that's perfect start for the next one. Terrific. Perfect. It's been yeah. a delight as always. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm off to the next conversation. And anybody oh, out there? By the way, I, I had a long, very nice interview with Greg Kaminsky last week. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> if we do a four soon, we could invite him. Sure. <laughs> That's what we're thinking about. And certainly get a proper Varayana Buddhist in here from, from America. There you go. <laughs> All right. See you next time. Yeah, Thanks see both. you next time. Big yeah, luck. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. <laughs>